Going through the medical journey is incredibly stressful and competitive. And the further you go, the more competitive and stressful it gets. Today, I'm going to break down the process of getting into fellowship, and more importantly, if doing a hospital here like I did is a good move or something you should definitely reconsider. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In case you're new here, my name is Laksh. I am a second going on to third year cardiology fellow. And today, I really just wanted to make an episode for any of you guys that are interested in doing subspecialties, particularly in the field of internal medicine. And considering this more and more common question that I get from peers and people on channel of do or should I do a hospitalist here before applying a fellowship? Does it work in my favor? What type of things should I do to make myself more competitive? Should I just apply straight on? Now, I personally took one year off to work as an internal medicine hospitalist. If you want to see kind of what my day in the life is or follow some of those videos that I made when I was a hospitalist, I'll link those down below. But today's episode, I really want to break down the logistics of being a hospitalist, the goods that I was able to take away from it, some of the cons, and then particularly at the very end of the episode, I'll break down what type of things you you should do during your hospital here if you choose to do one to make yourself competitive. And I'll even break down what the data of highly competitive program directors from fellowship programs want to see from anyone who takes a hospital here. So make sure you stay tuned. And if at any point in this episode, if you're interested in learning more of how to get into fellowship, I'll link down the information below for an upcoming workshop that we have about essentially how to be a competitive fellowship applicant. So I'll link that information down below in case you're interested, but let's get into the pros and cons. Now being a hospital for me had a ton of benefits. And I want to give some context to why I made decision to pursue a hospital here. When I was finishing my three years of internal medicine residency, I was pretty sure I was going to go down the cardiology route, but there's still a decent part of me that says, what if you just like general medicine and being a hospitalist and having every other week off and still making a great six figure income, being able to travel with your family, being able to be flexible with your schedules and trading it with colleagues. If you had something that you needed to attend, like a wedding, etc. that sounds pretty nice. And what if I could even double that and move back home to be near both my and my wife's family and have a great career close to the people and the support system that I wanted. And then as a third chair on top, what if I actually enjoyed that job enough that I would want to do it for the rest of my life? So that's ultimately why I elected to just say, you know, let's give this hospital thing a go. Worst thing that happens is a few months into the line, I realize it's not for me and I apply for fellowship. But at least I get to spend some time being home, making a good income, having every other week off. And best case scenario, I pick a job close to home and maybe I feel like I don't need to do fellowship. And so that's really kind of the context that I went into my hospital here with and it was a great decision for the many reasons I'll talk about. The first biggest benefit of being a hospitalist that I get complimented all the time right now as a fellow is just my efficiency. When you are a hospitalist, no one is helping you. It's literally just you. And so you may be taking care of a list of 18, 20 plus patients in a day. And unless you want to be there till like 8 p.m. writing your notes and repeat the process again at 7 the next morning, you have to be quick and seeing patients, seeing new consults, seeing new admits, writing your documentation, discharging patients, triaging who's sick and who's not sick, and really prioritizing your entire day and workflow. And it took me, you know, a week or two to really like get down the efficiency thing and just build on top of it. But because I was a hospitalist used to seeing a lot of patients, often in fellowship, I have a bigger team. Maybe there's a nurse practitioner who's also helping me or an attending who's also seeing patients in addition to me. Maybe the list is just not as big as it was when I was an IM doctor. For all those reasons, being efficient has significantly helped me when things really get busy. Other fellows who may have gone straight through the process of going through med school, through residency, and now fellowship may not have had that luxury. So efficiency is a big part in the process. Number two is just feeling more comfortable and being like an owner of my decisions. When you're hospitalist, you are the head honcho, you're the only honcho. And so if a patient needs medications, treatments, and diagnoses, fully falls on you. Now as a fellow, I have a little kind of curtain of safety being my attending and my supervisors who are overseeing my decisions and my diagnoses and my management. But still, I feel comfortable because of my hospitalist here, more comfortable probably than others, of just making decisions on my patient's behalf, saying, I think you have this, I think we should be doing this and still running it by my attending, but my attendings can quickly start to feel that like at least this person owns their patients. They think about how to manage it as if they were the only manager in this whole system. And that has helped me grow as a cardiology fellow and ideally will for you too. Being a hospitalist just gives you a lot of repetitions of flexing the muscle of just saying, gotta make a call. What are we gonna do? What are all the things we're going to do for this patient? And then when you're a fellow, again, even though you have a little extra safety and margin of error because somebody's overlooking your decisions, you get better at just being a fellow is if you assume that there's no one overseeing your decisions because you then learn the nuances of decision making. In the same way that making decisions as a hospital has helped me, doing the same as a fellow has made me clinically stronger in cardiology just because I've made more reps. I'm saying, let's just give this a shot, see what my attending says about my decision plan. Number three is this concept of the figure out mentality. When you're a hospitalist, again, a lot of kind of nuances of everything in the patient's care. When you're a specialist, you focus on a lot less, but there's still a lot of things to manage, particularly in the field of cardiology where we just deal with so many 
any diagnoses. But thankfully, as a hospice, one thing you just have to do is just figure out how to improve the patient and ideally get them home. That includes what consultants you need to call, what labs you need to do, what small creative things you may have to do with social work to be able to get them home safely. And now transitioning into cardiology fellowship, not everyone is going to be clean cut. Everyone is not going to be somebody you can just manage what most recent guidelines in cardiology or to whatever up to date says. You have to be a little bit creative and think outside the box and this figure out mentality of here's the patient, here's the problem that I'm facing. What are ways that I can tackle this to help improve this patient, ideally get them home home still sticks with me. And being a fellow, I've realized I've been able to creatively get things done just because, again, another muscle that I was able to flex as a hospitalist. Benefit number four is my medicine foundation is much stronger. This like goes without saying, but it is very understated, is that because you spend an extra year as a hospitalist, even if you'd spent three years in residency, being a hospitalist, ideally your foundation in medicine just goes up because, again, you're making all the calls. So if you weren't good at managing liver patients at residency, but you had a team that could kind of creep you along, now because the decision's on you, you get better about reading about things and making managements for them. And ideally you see those patients enough that you get kind of a baseline of this is how I take care of this when I'm by myself. This is what I do for this. These are who are the people I need to call. So now as a cardiology fellow, even though I'm called for things that seem to be a primary heart problem, often the heart is at stress because of something else. And so I think about endocrine pathologies. I think about renal issues. I think about you know electrolyte abnormalities differently than maybe my other co-fellows and attendings do just because I've had that background of thinking medicine first, cardiology second. Heart's not always a problem. Sometimes it is. And just knowing the differences of what fits and what doesn't through pattern recognition that I was able to do as a hospitalist has translated well because again, my medicine foundation is a little bit stronger. That's one of the biggest benefits of being a hospitalist. Because in reality, what's the point of going through all of that med school, all of those years of residency, if you're just going to forget it all as soon as you become a subspecialist? And maybe you realize and decide that you don't actually care about all the other things not related to your subspecialty. But at least if you're going to spend the training, my argument is that makes sense to give yourself a year of practice where you have to still improve on them. And then if you choose to do something else, ideally you'll have a nice baseline to fall back on. Benefit number five. Seems like a con, but it was actually the biggest takeaway for me as my hospice year. Because again, I went into this entire journey thinking, well, what if I like this? Maybe I just like withdraw my fellowship application. Maybe I just stick to being a hospitalist and having every like seven days off, which is amazing. But I realized that I actually did not care for everything that a hospitalist does. I didn't necessarily enjoy all the aspects of general internal medicine, like maybe I'd convinced myself back in residency. And I really just didn't like the role of being a hospitalist for like a 15, 20 year kind of career, if not longer. Just three months in, I was like, man, I'm like getting bored on some days. Or sometimes I would find that I would have a streak of days where I just wasn't interested in coming to work. Not because I was tired, more so because the medicine wasn't interesting. It wasn't intellectually like what I care to do every single day. Not that it was easy or hard. Um, I was probably right in the middle, but I couldn't see myself being happy doing it for 15 plus 20, 30 years. And that's a big kind of highlight. They're like, oh, this is probably not a future career for me. I should really consider doing something that would be interesting for the rest of my life. And the final benefit for me just came in the combination of location, lifestyle, and financial benefits. Being again, back home near family. My wife was back home near our family. We had a daughter, thus our daughter is now being able to be raised with her grandparents nearby, which is amazing. Having a six figure income and both of us being relatively pretty frugal and saving that to ultimately have this house that we were able to put you know, a down payment on because of the money that we were able to make during my hospice here. In addition, I was able to use that week on week off kind of method to do a lot of vacations. We went on like six trips during my hospice here, including our baby moon to Hawaii, New York. We did Europe before we even started our hospice here. And we never get to travel to that extent with that level of freedom, but it was amazing. And definitely a year that my wife and I look on and very positive note. And so being a hospice was, was definitely gracious in those regards. The final benefit is that ideally being back home and staying for fellowship in my hometown was something I would consider. If the program was strong and the program would have me. And so I specifically seeked out the opportunity to be a hospitalist at the institution where the fellowship happens. And so I was able to have more face time, understand the program, understand did the fellows like it, and then also express my interest throughout the year and not just an interview process. That ultimately was like the biggest reason probably that I am a fellow where I am now and having that position because I was just able to just set myself up and super satisfied because again, I am still near family, enjoy my fellowship, enjoy my training, but it is at the location that I ideally want to be in. And so for all those reasons, being a hospice to me was a fantastic move. But I do want to hit on a few cons because it doesn't necessarily work the nicest for everybody. So con number one is that it's a demanding job and you don't necessarily always have the highest daily satisfaction, particularly if you can't get all of the things that I was able to work out, like ideal location, or maybe it doesn't have a fellowship program that you want to go to or that you can go to because they don't have anything in-house. Coming to work at a place that you will feel like you're ultimately going to 
to leave. If anything changes the role that I'll be playing, it could be hard. Again, the job can be very demanding on a big spectrum. For me, being a hospitalist where I was doing residency, significantly harder than the role that I had to play current, you know, at this private hospital. Just because the amount of patients you take care of and the load and the demand and the constant cycle where you're just replaceable. People weren't necessarily trying to make the medicine doctors happy just because there was another medicine doctor in line that could take their job. And so you have to be really careful of where you ultimately elect to be a hospitalist because the job's not necessarily easy anywhere, but you don't want to be in a place where there's a constant cycle of people leaving within just a few months because of the job environment or the demand of the job. Because you always have to assume that fellowship may not work out. So do you want to be at this place that you took a job at as a hospitalist forever? Asking the right questions when you're interviewing. And I've made kind of the series of when I was applying um, for my hospitalist job down below. So if you guys are interested, I'll link that. But it's a high demanding job. So you want to be very careful of what environment you put yourself in and in the name of being strategic as well. And then really the only second con that I can think of is that you do miss a year of training that would have allowed you to kind of make the financial benefits of being an attending and just moving on with your life by doing a hospitalist year. So if you're somebody who is in your third year, you think you're competitive, but want to consider doing a chief year or hospitalist year just to like potentially add something else to your repertoire, you don't have a good reason of why you're making that change just aside from just like you want to, then you miss out a year. Maybe you have to convince more people when you're interviewing why you took the hospitalist year in the first place. For me, I had a good reason. Again, I wanted to be close to family. I was still making decisions between medicine and cardiology. And I was able to help tell the story the way I ideally was able to in this podcast of why I made that decision to ultimately pursue and apply for cardiology. But if you miss a year and you don't have a good reason of why you're pursuing the hospitalist year in the first place, it can just look like maybe you're not interested in the field that you ultimately apply to. So you have to be really careful. Have a good reason. And if you think you're competitive, if people, your mentors, your support systems, your advisors are telling you're competitive, your scores are competitive, your research is competitive for your subspecialty, then really consider applying while you're in your final year of fellowship. And if it doesn't work out, you can always be a hospitalist and redo the process. But always be really careful about not having a good clear forward plan just because it can bite you in the butt later on. Now for the last part of this episode, I'm going to talk about what type of things you can do during your hospital year to increase your chances of getting into fellowship. And again, if you're interested in more details and the nitty gritty about how to make this process really effective, that workshop I'll link down below of how to be a competitive fellowship applicant. And so it gets into the part of this episode where we talk about how do you make yourself competitive? How do you stage yourself to use this year as an advantage for all the things that I talked about? The efficiency, ownership, the ability to just figure things out, um, the ability to just kind of like own your patients and then be able to flex that muscle when you're a subspecialist. So the study kind of lays the groundwork for this last part of this episode, which is if you do a hospitalist year, how do you set yourself up to be as competitive as possible? If you're interested in the nitty gritty of that study, I'll link it down below. But really the most important thing for your hospitalist year is you want to be very strategic of still looking interested in the field. And so the first and most important thing you can do during your hospitalist year is despite being good at medicine, despite being more efficient, etc., is understand strategically what you're going to do to be and show your interest in development in the field of cardiology. Some low hanging fruits include just finishing some research products that you may have had during residency, reaching out to your mentors and finishing up any manuscripts or abstracts you may have had. I know I did that. It's super helpful. And it just also allows your mentors to still hear from you during your hospitalist year. But even where you are a hospitalist, you can try to see, is there something you can do within your field and subspecialty with the individuals that are there? Maybe there's like very traditional research that's being done where like you're evaluating data and doing those kinds of things. Or you can do things that are QI, right? So maybe if I wanted to go into cardiology, I would have found people doing quality improvement projects around the hospital, around the field of cardiology, playing a role in that. So then when I was applying for fellowship, I could say, well, I'm a hospitalist, but for the field of cardiology, this is what I'm doing right now. And that's the biggest thing you want to do. You want to just be able to say, here are multiple experiences that I'm doing despite being a hospitalist. Because let's be honest, everybody knows that you probably have four to seven days off throughout the week or every other week. And so the real question is, what are you doing with that extra time knowing that you're sitting in front of me applying for this program? The second thing I would recommend is before you leave residency, ideally, is identify who's going to write your letters of recommendation. Ideally have four, if not five individuals who would write your letters, mentors within the field of their special specialty. So for me, I like three cardiologists, and like one medicine doctor, but have them write your letter before you graduate. If you can to say, Hey, I'm applying for fellowship next year. Do you think you'd be able to kind of draft an initial letter? So that way our memories and our experiences are fresh and then I can share my CVs and updates throughout the year when I'm a hospitalist for a year or two. And then you can update that letter. It helps them out if they're going to agree to write you a letter anyways, writing it in a year or two when it's time for you to apply and they've kind of forgotten about all the individual experiences with you. It's kind of a letdown, right? They 
clearly have high opinions of you, but they may not remember the exact experiences that, that led them to believe that. And so just be in a situation where you kind of set yourself up. So really in residency, after any big rotation where you work with somebody, they get to really work with you, know you, they're impressed by you ideally, ask for the letter, and then sooner than later, ask for them to potentially draft a few things. Maybe it's a notes that they can just keep in track of that they can add to their letter at a later point. And that second part of that advice is definitely just keep them updated during your hospital's year or years of what type of things are going on. I know at least one to two of my mentors, I wrote my letters, I was constantly just kind of keeping them posted when I had my daughter or how fellowship was going or kind of career plans I was making, mainly because those ideally will be mentors that stick with you throughout the rest of your life. And then you can constantly kind of go back to and look for support and look for guidance and it will be able to allow them to vouch for you a lot more aggressively than somebody that like used to be one of their residents or trainees a few years back. Number three is to use your time as a hospitalist to keep up to date with your specific field. So still got to lay in the groundworks to being a good foundational hospitalist. But if I was interested in the field of GI, for example, I should still be learning and listening to podcasts or reading articles or just like knowing what's in the news through Twitter about the field of GI. And that way, when you're applying for fellowship, you're constantly kind of up to date on the news things that are going on. But ideally, when you start fellowship, it's not like you just had a year away from the field. If anything, you are still on top of it. You have your pulse on the most recent updates. And because of your extra time, you probably are going to be more, you know, in tune with what's going on in the field of GI than maybe some of your co-fellows later on who's just had less time when they were actually residents and didn't have the luxury of being a hospitalist. So just stay up to date, be a good foundational hospitalist, but then find extra times within your days and weeks or just like listening to a cardiology podcast, which is what I do, or finding a review article on topics in the field of oncology. Again, if that's your interest. And the last thing is that if you're trying to be location specific, ultimately where you apply to fellowship, really be strategic on where you choose to work as a hospitalist. Maybe you consider working as a hospitalist like I did at a place that has an in-house fellowship program. And that way you get to make it very clear throughout the year that you're interested and you're you know, like easy to get along to, you're not awkward. And maybe it makes you an easier yes. Now this is going to work on less competitive programs, more so like if you're applying to the biggest names, they're going to have their picking. And so just because you are a hospitalist at their institution, it may not provide you any benefit. But if you have a mid to lower tier competitive program that still is going to give you great training, but allows you to be in the location you desire, super something important to consider. If you are somebody who is less in specific city, but more just wants to be in a location, general location area, think of a few places that may have multiple hospitals opportunities around them with multiple fellowship programs, especially in the big cities where there may be two or three fellowship programs within the vicinity. Maybe you can find a hospitalist gig, but then still allows you to make the other institutions nearby say, hey, I live in the city. I'd love to stay here. You know, I'm a hospitalist currently here, but involved in all the cardiology stuff or all of my subspecialty stuff still while being a hospitalist, but I would love to interview at your program. At least gets your foot in the door and making it very clear that you're interested in staying around, which is a big thing when you're applying to fellowship and a big thing for the program to understand like this person may want to stay here. If they end up being good, then you become a little bit of an easier bet than everyone else who may come from like the other side of the country. But those guys are my biggest takeaways of being a hospitalist, of applying a fellowship that I could think of. For me, again, it was an amazing move. It worked out brilliantly. I got very lucky in many scenarios and I'm not very happy, but part of luck is just being prepared for the opportunity when it comes. And so I feel like I've done that. Hopefully this episode allows you to understand how you can do that for your own journey. Let me know in the comment section what questions you have about fellowship or applying to fellowship in general, and I'm happy to make more episodes in the future. And again, if you're interested in the nitty gritty of how to be a competitive fellowship applicant, I'll put the link down below so that way you can get all the nitty gritty. But as always, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit that like and subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast listening platform. And considering watching this episode right here of why I ultimately chose the field of cardiology and this episode right here in my day in the life as a cardiology fellow. But as always, my friends, thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I was a little help to you guys on yours. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.